Hello, I'm Deborah Sweet. I'm the Vice President of Editorial at Cell Press. And I'm very grateful to the organizers of this exciting, interesting meeting for giving me the opportunity to talk to you today about what we're doing at Cell Press to help build gender equity in science. I'm also very grateful to all of my colleagues across Cell Press for their enthusiasm and engagement about this important topic, and particularly to my three co-authors who see listed below, who've been very helpful in both putting together the initiatives I'm going to talk to you about and gathering the data that I needed for this presentation. So I'm going to talk to you about five different areas in which we at Cell Press are making a conscious effort to advance gender equity in science. Before I start on that, I do want to emphasize that we're thinking about a lot of different areas as well in relation to inclusion and diversity. And we're working on in several different areas, but I'm gonna be focusing on gender here because that's the topic of this meeting. So I'm gonna to talk to you about our advisory boards and the progress we're making towards our equity goals there. Reviewer polls and particularly analysis of progress in increasing the number of women reviewers at Cell. Authorship, looking at our submitting authors and looking at the balance generally and whether there's been an impact of COVID-19. Visibility, thinking about visibility for women scientists, but also about issues that relate to women in science. And then also our Cell Symposia series, increasing the number of women speakers that we invite to those. First of all, our advisory board gender balance pledge. We made a commitment at the beginning of this year that we would increase the number of women that we have on our journal advisory boards across the journals that you see listed below. The commitment we made was that by the end of 2020, all of our journals would have at least 30% women representation on their advisory boards and our goal is 50%. I do need to be clear just to make sure there's no misunderstanding. The vast majority of our journals are run by internal professional editors who handle the manuscript review and make the decisions. The advisory boards function in an advisory capacity to help us with, help us with reviewing papers, but then also with broader policy issues. We chose to focus on the advisory boards for two reasons. One is that it's something we have direct control over. We choose who we invite to be on these boards. But also being on these boards is a measure of professional recognition. We pick people who are prominent in the field and whose advice we value. And so we're helping to recognize the contribution women scientists make by making sure that they're represented on these boards. So you'll see at the beginning of the year, this is where things stood. Some journals already had a pretty strong representation. You see Cell had made a change to have 50% women in their board, which is very impressive. But other journals were significantly below the 30% threshold. Overall, across these journals listed at that time, we were at 30% representation by women. So this is a progress report in September. I'm pleased to say we have made progress. More of the journals listed have at least 30% women board members than they did before. And more of them also have 50% or more up from three and five now up from three in February. So across all of these journals, we're now at 35% women on the advisory boards up from 30% at the beginning of the year. And they're hoping that by the end of the year, once all of the journals get to at least 30%, that will go up even a little bit more. You see some journals are doing really well already. Cell reports medicine at, 60, medicine at 61%, which is pretty impressive. Other journals do still have progress to make. I'd also like to highlight iScience, which has a series of special issues which are run by external guest editors, and they focused on inviting women to participate. And at this point, 33% of their external guest editors are women, which is also a really good show. So good job, iScience. A little bit about Helion, which is a journal that joined Cell Press relatively recently. This is a broad scope open access journal. And it's run somewhat differently to most of our other journals and it is run by external academic editors supported by a dedicated team of internal editorial assistants. Helion is organized into subject sections. Each of the sections is run by one or two section editors supported by associate editors and then an advisory board. The Helion team have been focusing on making sure that women are well represented here as well. And they're up to 23% women across the team of section and associate editors. And then also the advisory board is a work in progress and is currently at 17% women for the data that we have. Next, I'm going to talk about Cell's commitment to shift the balance in its review pool. I hope at least some of you will remember this powerful editorial that Sri wrote in September 2019, in which the Cell team did a manual assessment of their review pool in 2018 and found that only 18% of their reviewers were women. They decided this was not nearly good enough and therefore made a conscious pledge that they would engage a broader pool of reviewers across gender, career stage, and geography for all the papers they review. And this required significant effort on the part of the cell editors to make sure they reached out and diversified their reviewer pool. So I'm gonna tell you about the progress that they've made. The bottom line is they've made a tremendous progress. 
Um, you'll see there down here at the bottom of this slide, the number of women, percentage of women reviewers at Cell has gone up from 18% in 2018 up to 30% in 2020, which is significant change. Out of interest, they also looked at the COVID-19 papers in 2020, and those also have about 30% women reviewers. The way we're measuring this is by asking everyone who, when they first log into our manuscript system, to answer a question and self-identify themselves in terms of their gender. We, the options we give are man, woman, non-binary, and we also give people the option if they prefer not to say. This information is, of course, completely confidential, and we're only using it to measure ourselves. But you can see on the graph on the right that using this question, we've managed to get to the point where we do have information about the gender identity of the majority of the reviewers, and therefore we can make these kinds of assessments. And we can monitor ourselves going forward as well. We're using a similar approach to look at the gender identification of submitting authors. The same thing, when people submit a new paper, we ask them to self-identify so we can track the, the gender balance of our submitting authors. We're doing this across a broad range of our journals. You can see the list below, and you can see the progress that we're making in terms of having the information in the graph. The reason the, the number of unidentified authors is going down is because more and more journals are starting to implement this gender identification question. So you see overall, we have about 20% of our submitting authors, which is usually, but not always the corresponding author, are women across all of these journals that we're listed, listing. We also looked at whether we've seen an impact of COVID-19 on the number of women submitting authors, because there's been quite a lot of discussion about how perhaps the whole coronavirus situation is negatively impacting women's sciences more strongly than men. We haven't really seen a significant change. If you look here, we looked at January to April and then May to August, and in both cases overall on these journals, we have about 20% women submitting authors. And if you look at different individual journals, in some cases it goes up a bit, some cases it goes down a bit. Overall, we're not seeing a consistent change as a result of COVID-19. Next, I'm going to talk about efforts to increase visibility of issues facing women in science through special features. A number of our journals have had things, features related to this. We've done special issues, perspectives, commentaries, editorials, all about this overall topic about increasing diversity in science and issues that face women. So I can, I'm going to illustrate a few examples here just to give you an idea. I'd like to highlight this one in particular, Trends in Cognitive Sciences covered this topic, also Neuron. The idea that we could perhaps use AI-based mechanisms to scan reference lists and see if we can address or redress the balance in re reference citation and the systematic under-citation of women that many studies have identified. It'd be interesting to see whether we can use approaches like that to help improve the recognition of women and women in science going forward. Another way we have to increase the visibility of women scientists is through highlighting two approaches to this. One is the invited front matter. We've been making a conscious effort to increase the number of women that we invite to write front matter articles. Cell has led the way on this, although many other journals are making a similar change too. And you'll see from the graph here that the Cell team have managed to significantly increase the number of the front matter items that they've invited that have at least one woman corresponding author from 2018 to 2020. They've also looked at a video abstract, which is a mechanism we have for inviting authors to make a short video about their paper to highlight it and explain it. They've, they've made an effort to increase the number of women corresponding authors who make video abstracts and been successful there as well. In 2018, only 8% of sales video abstracts had women corresponding authors. In 2019, they're up to 32%. So good job the Cell team there as well. The last thing I want to talk with you about is Cell Symposia. These are a series of meetings that we run in collaboration with the scientific community. They're two and a half day meetings where we really focus strongly on networking and visibility. We made a decision that we wanted to in increase the number of women invited speakers that we have. And you see that from the, from the table at the bottom and also from the graph that we've been successful in doing so. We went up from 21% women speakers in 2015 up to our invited speakers in 2020 were over 50%, which is an impressive improvement. Of course, the 2020 series is completely disrupted by coronavirus and many of these meetings have been postponed, but we're still looking forward to running them in the future when we're able to. One of the 2020 meetings I particularly want to highlight is this one, Conceptual Power of Single Cell Biology, which is now unfortunately postponed, of course, until 2022. But it was our first meeting that had entirely women invited speakers. And I think if you look down this list, you'll see that this is a really illustrious group of fantastic scientists and I think it's a real testament to the contribution women are making to science that we can put together a meeting of this quality with just women speak speakers. 
So that's it. That's all I'm going to cover. Um, if you hope you enjoyed it, if you have any questions or you want to know more, I'd be happy to chat at our booth. I'll be there from 7 till 8 a.m. Eastern, which is 1 to 2 p.m. European time on Thursday. Hope to see you there. Bye-bye.